that is called uh, I agree with what God said and today we're going to give you part three of that but go with me in your Bible to Ezekiel 37 and we're going to look at verses three through five and for many of you this is a very familiar passage of scripture but I encourage you to stay with me because God showed me something in my study this week that I have not seen before regarding this scripture it says this and he said unto me, son of man. So this is Ezekiel talking about what God said to him. And he said unto, and he said unto me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again, he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye or you shall live. Again, our thought for today is we are continuing in our series of I agree with what God said. We are coming from the book of Ezekiel, and Ezekiel, for context, so you can understand who this is, Ezekiel is a priest and a prophet. Somebody say a priest and a prophet. And this is significant because he has dual responsibilities. A prophet during this time would hear from the Lord and would go to God's people and to speak to God's people what God said. Are you still with me? And the majority of that time, that word was a prediction about the future. This is where we are and this prophetic word is telling you about what is to come. It is a prediction. It is telling you what's getting ready to happen. This is the responsibility of a prophet during this particular time. Ezekiel was specifically ministering during the darkest days of the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah during this time was in the midst of a 70-year period of Babylonian captivity. Again, these are God's people, Judah, the, the, the tribe of praise and worship, are in captivity. How could God's tribe that's responsible for praise and worship be in captivity? They're in captivity because they disobey God. So you could have a song that you sing and still be captive because you didn't do what he said. Are you still here today? And God, back in the day before the precious grace of Jesus Christ, he didn't play. And so if you didn't do what he said, then there was a, there was a, 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 a result of your disobedience. And Judas result of the price that they had to pay from their disobedience is that they're in captivity for 70 years. They're in captivity for nearly two generations. Are you still with me? So these are dark days for the tribe of Judah. These are dark days for the church that would sing. Are you still with me? But he comes to Ezekiel and tells Ezekiel, I, I, I want you to do something for me. I want you to let them know that even though they are in a present judgment, that there is a future glory. I don't know about you, but that's good news to me, that no matter how dark and difficult the day is, that the day can't last. The, 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 the day has, the sun has to set and, and, and the sun will rise again. The, 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 no, how, no matter how difficult the season, the season can't last all year. No, 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 no matter how long the year, the year has to turn. Are y'all still with me? So no matter what you're going through or experiencing, whether it is because of your disobedience or whether it's because of your growth, I want you to know it cannot last forever. There is a time, there is a moment of future glory. 
and God was ready to pronounce the future glory. So he takes Ezekiel on a field trip. Are y'all here? Go with me to Ezekiel, the 37th chapter, first and the second verse. It says, the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and sat me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. Are y'all still with me? So God took Ezekiel on a field trip. Ezekiel, I'm getting ready to take you somewhere because there's something that I need you to see. And I want you to know that Ezekiel was used to this because this was his fourth, fourth field trip. Are y'all still with me? This was the fourth field trip that God took Ezekiel on. But in this field trip, there is something specific that is happening. He takes Ezekiel in the spirit to a valley that has dry bones. So he didn't take him literally to a valley of dry bones. He took him to a place that in the spirit he could see a valley of dry bones. This is important. Stay with me. So he is walking through the midst of a valley that is full of dry bones. And God asked Ezekiel a question. In Ezekiel 37 and 3, he asked him a question, and he said unto him, son of man, can these bones live? Stop. He asked Ezekiel an impossible question. He asked Ezekiel, is the thing that you are seeing, is it possible for it to not be this way? He asks Ezekiel what he thinks of this. Why is this necessary? I want you to write this down. This is necessary that God is having this conversation with Ezekiel. Why? Because God operates in the earth by invitation only. Write it down. God operates in the earth, in your life in the life of your loved ones, by invitation only. I told you on last week, shared with you last week, God will not force himself on you. God will not make you do anything. The Bible says that God has given us dominion, and therefore we have a choice. He has given us dominion over this earth. It is our responsibility to invite God into the place he gave us dominion and ask him that we would cooperate with him or agree with him for the thing that he wants to get done. So there is something that God wants to get done, but he needs first for Ezekiel to see, is this something that can be done? Because if Ezekiel doesn't believe it, then Ezekiel won't invite God to get it done. Are, are y'all here? You got to believe it first. You got to see it be possible first. But it's always like this as a result of God asking you a question or telling you his intentions. God's word is his intention. When you read his word, it is his intention. His intention is that you are the head and not the tail. His intention is that you are blessed and that you are highly favored. His intention is that you have long life and prosper. Are y'all here? I feel like that's Star Trek. But it is his intention. Are y'all here? That good things would happen to you. It is his intention that you know that he's got you covered, but he will not force his intentions upon you. Because his intentions requires your invitation. Because your invitation is you saying to God, I read your intention and I decide to agree with it. 
And I invite you into my heart. I invite you into this place. I invite you. That, thank you, Father. That's so good. It's his intention that you would be saved. Yes. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's his intention. That whoever would believe in him, won't perish, but have everlasting life. That's his intention. But he doesn't force his intention. His intention requires an invitation. That's why we say to you, you got to invite God into your heart. Because it is your invitation that seals his intention. Oh, I... Ooh, I wish this church was full with people that we pastor so they can hear what's being said. We walk through life powerless, not because we don't have dominion, but because we are ignorant as to how it works. Yes. Right. All we need to know is that if this is your word, God, if this is what you said, if this is your intention for my life and for my family and for my future, that I invite you in to let your intentions take place. Well, he asked Ezekiel, Ezekiel, can these bones live? He asked him the question of his intention. Are you, are, are you still here? Yeah. Because the intention still requires the invitation. God, why would you take me on this field trip and take me to this place of dry bones? And in this place, ask me an impossible question. Well, he's doing that because he wants to do something impossible with you. Same reason, why would he bother you in your dreams and show you something greater if his intention is not to give you what he's showing you? It's because he's waiting for you to agree with the intention and to invite him in. If he show you that you are going to write a book and it's going to be published, that's his intention. you got to invite the author in because he's already the author and the finisher of your faith. Woo, God, that's good. If he's the author and finisher of your faith, then why can't he be the author and finisher of the book of your faith? Amen. Are you still in here? Yes. You have to invite the intention. Can these bones live? Can you own a new business? Can you do this over here? Can you... Huh, what is it that God is asking of you? Can it be? Because I, I listen, listen. I, I don't want you to think, well, it's too late. I, I'm too old, I, or I, I, I've tried up all of my chances, or uh, I, I, I'm too dirty, or I've done too much, or I've been too bad. Listen, if any of those things were true, then He would stop talking to you about His intentions. If he's still talking to you about his intentions, then it means that there's still time for the intentions to be done. He's just waiting for you to invite him for the intention. Are you still here? But there'll come a day if you keep buffering his intention that he'll stop speaking to you about what he wants to do. Are you still here today? His intention. Turn to somebody say his intention. His intention needs your invitation. Come on, tell him that. His intention needs your invitation. So look at what Ezekiel's response was. Ezekiel 70, 30, excuse me, 37 and 3. Watch this. No, 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 go back. Ezekiel 37 and 3. Here's a B part of that verse. And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Or in other words, Ezekiel, can this be done? Ezekiel was smart. He said, God, you know. <laughs> it's like my mama asking me, did you just lie to me? And that's me saying, like me responding to her saying, you know. Now I lose my teeth afterwards, but you know, you know, <laughs> you know. Ezekiel was smart. He didn't deny that it was possible. But he simply said to God, God, you know. I think Ezekiel said this, follow me for a moment. I think Ezekiel said this because Ezekiel was familiar of the stories of God raising dead people back to life. 
He had heard those stories. He may have even witnessed them because if he's a prophet, he had to go to the school of prophets and he had to learn about the things that are possible and how to prophesy. It is possible, I'm sure, that he heard the stories, saw the evidence about God raising somebody who was dead back to life. But God, this one is a little bit different because you didn't take me to a valley of dead people. You took me to a valley of bones, which means these people have been dead enough. <laughs> They've been dead for so long that they're, oh, I should have looked that up. Write this down so next time I preach this to find out how long it takes for a body to decompose and everything to fall off. They were dead that long that the skin fell off. Everything fell off. Everything was gone. And then on top of that, it wasn't just bones. The Bible says it was dry bones, which means that the marrow and everything else on the inside of the bone had dried out. So it was there long enough, not just for the stuff on top of the bone to disintegrate, but for everything inside of the bone to be gone. These were dry, skeletal bones. And God asked Ezekiel, do you think I can make these live again? Because it's, it's easier to think God can make something live again that you still see. How can God make something live again that according to your understanding, there's no way possible it could happen? So Ezekiel said the smart thing, God, you know. He was letting God know, if this is possible, only you can do it. And just because I haven't seen it doesn't mean it's not possible. Are y'all here? There are some things God's going to ask you, is it possible? Is it possible for you to start a business in your 70s? Well, God, you know. Is it possible for you to go get a house and your credit is in the 400s? Well, God, you know. Is it possible for you to get a house and you ain't got no money for a down payment and everything against you is saying, why is you even thinking about a house? Well, God, you know. Is it? Y'all don't hear me today. Is it possible for you to be the CEO of a company and you don't have higher education? All you have is God giving you insight and telling you what to do. Well, God, only you know. Well, let me tell you what he knows. He knows that anything is possible if you believe him. And if you decide, God, I will agree with what you have said. So in other words, God, on this fourth trip, on this fourth uh, 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 field trip you have me on, I've learned enough to know that if you said it, it can be done. Are you here? And that's what we got to get to in our life, that God, if you said it, it can be done. If you show me the dream, it can be done. If you keep visiting me about something, it can be done. If you keep sharing your word about this, then it can be done. I don't, hey, 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 I, I just, whoo, I, I heard something in my spirit. I don't care how dead it is. I don't care what the doctors are saying. I don't care how bad it is. I don't care how long you've had it. I don't care how long it's been dead and seemed like it can't live. God, if you said it's possible, then it is possible. Can I get a witness in here today? If God said it's possible, then it is possible. So God, now hearing Ezekiel's response, now gives Ezekiel direction. And I'm going to say this, and I'm almost finished. I find this so prolific. In Ezekiel 37 and verses 4 through 5, this first part. Again, he said unto me, prophesy unto these bones. Say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. Seventh verse. So I prophesied as I was commanded. 
And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. Tenth verse. Woo-hoo, let me stop. I just saw something. What I like about that, God is so cold that when he causes the bones to come together, the wrong bone don't go to the wrong body. He makes sure that this bone gets to his bone. Let me keep going. Tenth verse. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Now, as prolific as all of this is, let me tell you what caught my attention, what jumped off the page, is that God told Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones. He didn't tell them to speak to the bones. So there has to be something specific and intentional about prophesying that's different from speaking. In the beginning, God said. It didn't say in the beginning, God prophesied. Are you here? When we speak, he tells us to speak his word. He doesn't tell us to prophesy his word. But in this scripture, he tells Ezekiel, the priest, to prophesy to the bones. So, 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 Mother Night, I went to go look up what does the word prophesy in this case mean? And the word prophesy is the Hebrew word now by. And this word means to speak or sing by inspiration. To speak or sing by inspiration. Not prediction, but by inspiration. Because prediction would be to be prophetic. (sighs) He wasn't asking him to be prophetic. He was asking him to prophesy. He was asking him to speak out of inspiration. What I love about this definition is that it is not exclusive to speaking, but you can also be inspired to sing. I don't know if you've ever been in your house washing your dishes and a song just drops in your heart and you begin to sing it. What you don't realize is God dropped that in your heart. He inspired the song in your heart because there's something in that song that he wants you to prophesy to your surroundings. You're not just singing to be singing. Why is it, hey, hey, why is it that when grandmama was by the sink washing the dishes and started to sing that the atmosphere of the house shifted? Why is it when mama did it, the atmosphere shifted because as they were singing, whether they knew it or not, God was inspiring them to sing something that would shift their atmosphere. Are you all here today? So it's not just in your singing. It's in your speaking. He said, I want you to speak under inspiration. What was Ezekiel's inspiration in this moment? His inspiration was he was with God. And God was telling him what was possible. And God was telling him what to speak. So therefore, he became inspired and he spoke what he heard God said. Or he prophesied. See, we think to prophesy is to be somewhere and to go into a catonic state and to look all spooky and to then to say, thus saith the Lord unto you this day. That is not prophecy according to this scripture. Prophecy is when you're under the inspiration of his word. And you speak his word to your circumstance. You speak his word to your situation. You speak his word to the things that are around you. You speak his word to your children. You speak his word to your boss. You speak his word in your prayer. Ma'am, sir, you are prophesying. 
Are, are, are y'all here today? <sighs> but Pastor Dorsey, here's the part that, I, that, that really got my attention. It's what he told him to prophesy to. Because God, hear me now, never tells you, let me, now I, I won't say never. God in this scripture didn't tell him to walk up to a particular person. And to say something to a person. He told him to say something to an issue. And I think sometimes we are talking to the wrong things. We are talking to people that we think can, can change it. Instead of prophesying to the circumstances and the things that God has already designed to bring about change. Mm. Because the Bible says... What did he prophesy to? Look, he said to him, prophesy unto these what? Bones. Tenth verse. So I prophesied, oh, so, so I prophesied as he commanded, and the breath came into them. Go back to the fourth verse. Prophesy unto these bones and say unto them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Then said the Lord to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. So as I prophesied, I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise. There's another scripture that says specifically that he prophesied to the breath. So the two things that he prophesied to is to bone and to breath. Listen, I, when I heard this, I'm sorry, I'm old school. I'm, I'm a baby of the 90s. I heard bone thugs and harmony, but I heard it differently. I heard bones, breath, and harmony. Are, are y'all here? It's in verse 9 that he says, speak to the bones. Are y'all still with me? So you have got to understand what he said and who he told them to prophesy to. He said, prophesy to the bones and to breath. Why is this? Because whenever God does anything, he does it through creation. Remember I told you <laughs> that in the beginning there was nothing. God said, let there be. His word is a creative word. Are you here? God doesn't need anything in order for his word to work outside of you agreeing with it. We sometimes think, well, God, I need $10,000. And if I just knew of somebody who was rich, I could go to that person and speak to that person and maybe get some money to come our direction. That's you trying to make something happen. But God doesn't need to make something happen with current things that already exist. God, if necessary, he will create something out of nothing because he's a creator, which is why he took him to a valley of dry bones. Hey, man. Ain't no skin on these bones. There's nothing left to these bones, and there's nothing inside of these bones. There's no way that you can scientifically tell me that I was able to raise something back from dry bones. This only could have been done because of the creative power of a great God. God is not limited by what you don't have. He's only limited by what you won't agree to. Turn to somebody and say, just agree with him. Just agree with him. Come on, turn to somebody and say, will you just agree with him? We make things harder than what they need to be because we won't agree with him. Bones and breath. I don't need nothing but your agreement. And I will create from nothing and cause it to be. Are you still with me? So then what does this mean? And I'm getting ready to take my seat. What does all of this mean? Ezekiel 37 and 11. Then he said unto me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel, Judah specifically. Behold, they say, our bones are dry and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Do you hear what they're saying? God's people are saying, 
The hope is lost. They're saying their bones are dry. They are saying the parts of our body have been cut off from each other, which is why God said, let me take you to a valley of true dry bones. Let me show you something that's worse than what they're saying. No matter how bad your situation is, it could be worse. It could be worse. It could uh, outdoors, no food. It could be worse. But God, even in the midst of what it is, can fix what it is, even if it was worse. So what's the whole point of this? God took him there to the valley, and I'm cutting through the field. He took him to the valley. He showed him all this because he wanted Ezekiel in the same fashion to go speak to Judah and to tell Judah what he was saying about their condition. Why, why didn't God just do it? If they were in captivity for 70 years, why didn't God just get them out of captivity? Wouldn't that be easy enough? God, we're in captivity. We're crying out to you. But we stopped crying out to you because we lost hope. Well, won't you just rescue us? And then now we got hope again. Why didn't he just pull them out of captivity himself? Why, why, Why did he need to take Ezekiel on this field trip? Why did he need Ezekiel to see these things? There's one reason why all of this happened, and I want you to write this down. Because God can't change anything until you speak it. God showed Ezekiel, this is what I want to change in Judah. This is what I want to change for Israel. But I can't change it, Ezekiel, until I get somebody like you to agree with it. And you agree with it by believing it and then going to speak it. So when he then went to God's people and spoke to God's people that God is going to deliver us, God is going to do what he said, God is doing it. Why? Because it is going to prove to you that he is our God. That can't happen until somebody believes what they saw and they look past what they see and they prophesied what they saw. Are you here today? That's why it can't happen. That's why it hasn't happened because God operates in this earth by invitation only. And if you don't invite him in, if you don't and decide to agree with his word, then God can't do for you what his word has said until you agree with it by speaking it. I wonder what's been held up in your life because you have been saying wishes instead of word. He doesn't have to respond to your wish. (sighs) He only responds to his word. And most of us, I'm not going to put you on the spot. If I were to ask you what your issue is and then ask you what's the word that you have been prophesying over your issue, it's possible that the majority of us couldn't give us the word. Because what we do oftentimes is regurgitate what other people have said. What we believe is going to get better. Where is that in the word? Because you can't prophesy, well, I believe it's going to get better. You can't prophesy, I hope it works out. You can only prophesy his word. I can prophesy to my body, I shall live and not die. Y'all didn't catch that. I should live and not die to declare 
the works of the Lord. If nobody says that I can prophesy over myself because I have been inspired by God's word because I spent time with it. Yeah. The reason, I hear you, God, I'm going to finish. Yeah. The reason we can't prophesy is because we're not inspired by his word because we don't spend time with the word. How can you be inspired by what you don't spend time with? You are only inspired by what you spend time with. And I can know what you spend time with and where you spent your time based upon what you are saying because you've already decided to agree with it. Well, you know, people can't live forever. Oh, that's, that's what you've decided to agree with. Well, you know, things have to come to an end. That's what you decided to agree with. Well, you know, if things are going down, it's looking bad. It must be telling you something. That's what you decided to agree with. Well, you know, they've been unsafe for a long time. So, you know, it's in God's hands now. That's what you've decided to agree with. Yeah. I promise you, all of what you just said, none of it is in his word. But the things that you can't agree with, and say, God, I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and but not beneath. And I'm going to so be in that word until it inspires me that I start speaking it everywhere I go. I speak it when I walk into the bank. I speak it when I deal with my finances and I got to balance and budget things. I speak it wherever I've got to deal with financial issues because I've been inspired by who I've been spending time with. And as a result, I can prophesy what's inspiring me. I know you may have gotten a diagnosis, but don't let the diagnosis be the thing you agree with. Let the diagnosis be the thing you take to God and you stay in his word until you can get something that you can agree with. Hey, I see in his word that everything has a name. But in this scripture, it says that at the name of Jesus, everything must bow in heaven and in earth. So the thing that I've been diagnosed with is nothing but a name. And if I'm inspired enough to give it to Jesus, if I'm inspired enough to speak his word, then I'll see the result of his word because I prophesy it to myself. What are you prophesying to yourself? What are you speaking to yourself? What are you telling yourself? What are you encouraging yourself about? What is it that you're facing with that you haven't taken to God to get a solution, a resolution of what you can prophesy? Stop accepting the crazy behavior of your children find in the word where your kid is and speak the word concerning your child and prophesy concerning your children. Are y'all here? Because when you prophesy, when you speak his word, when you agree with God, you invite God into your circumstance for him to do what he said. Last week, Mary did the same thing. Be it unto me according to your word. I invite you in to my life. I invite you into my presence. I invite you into my space. I decide to agree with what you said. I hear you, Father. I want you right now to get a sheet of paper, get your phone, get whatever it is. And I want you to own that. Just probably this is you and God. Write down what your issue is. Write down what you need God to address or to fix. Take a few seconds to do that. Now, right under that issue, circumstance, situation, write under that write the word that you are inspired by that speaks to your situation that speaks to your circumstance now if you don't have one then that means there's some homework you have this week 
you can Google, you can get on the computer and Google, what does God, what does God's word say about healing? What does God's word, say, what does the Bible say about, and it'll pull up a word, and you keep reading until something jumps in your heart. You keep reading until you find something, and you're like, my God, that is speaking to me. That is inspiring me. And that is the word that you got to sit under, that you got to meditate on, that you got to be with, because that's the word that in a very short moment, you'll have to begin to prophesy over your circumstance. Because again, things don't change because it's bad. Things change because you speak his word to what's bad. There's nothing too hard. There's no healing that's too hard. There is nothing that is too difficult. Are y'all here today? So make sure you take that this week and you begin to prophesy to your circumstance. Maybe the issue that you have is some children or grandchildren or some, some person that you're working with, whatever it is, you take that word and this week prophesy to it. This week say to God, God, I finally agree with what you're saying and watch what God will do. Amen? Stand to your feet. I got to stop. Stand to your feet. Father, I thank you today for this word. I thank you for everyone under the sound of my voice in this moment and in the moments to come that will hear this word. That it'll be at the right moment, the right time, in the right season. And God, I thank you that you're doing a work in us, that you're shifting us, that you're changing us, that you're getting us to the place to understand that your Bible, that your word is not just a book of historical facts. But your word is the solution to our life. Your word is the blueprint. Your word is every single thing that we need. And if your word is true, and it is, we have to start speaking your word. We have to start agreeing with your word. We have to, that when that circumstance pop up, that our response is not anything else other than your word. God, thank you for shaping our hearts, shaping our minds, and shaping our mouth that we will only respond with your word. And we give you praise for this, God. Now, God, there be anybody on the side of my voice that don't know you, that right now they're reaching their hand and their hearts to you. And that, God, right now, because they're reaching their heart to you, that, God, you see them. And in this moment, God, you are saving them from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. And I thank you, God, that their life will no longer be the same because in this moment, they gave their life to you. And I give you praise for it. Thank you for the change that's in our life because of what we heard today. In Jesus' name, let every glad heart say amen. Time. Thank you so much again for joining us here at CFFC. In addition to that, we'd love to further connect with you throughout the week. So if you haven't already, connect with a small group by visiting our website at cffc.org slash small dash groups. We can't wait to see you this week. <laughs> Life has a way of throwing us off course, causing us to lose that glimmer of hope that once upon a time twinkled in our eye. We can all remember the days when we were filled with enormous ideas, convinced we were going to take the world by storm. But as life goes on, that storm crushes us, and it leaves us with the remnants of a shattered dream. At this very moment, we are all in need of a voice of encouragement that will help us to rise from the depths of despair and be filled with hope as we once again pursue our dreams. We need to be reminded that we have purpose. Our dreams still matter and that the world is waiting on us. This is why I wrote this book. 
because I know what it is to be crushed with disappointment. I know what it is to wrestle with hopelessness. I know what it is to be down and counted out, but I also know what it is to rise and stand on top of the mountain and lift my hands and triumph because I had the boldness to dream again.